When we go into nature and we listen in a different way, then a new form of knowledge emerges. But if we rekindle a sense of connection, if we rekindle a sense of wholeness of being part of something bigger, then I feel that that creates a sense of beauty and wonder within ourselves and a sense of being part of something greater. And then naturally, we would cultivate a more beautiful world. Welcome, dear friends. Thank you for all your messages since our India episode last week and to those of you sharing the immunity protocol. Please do keep sharing this with people you know in India so that we can support the situation there. Our next course, Intuitive Flow, which will be hosted by me, will begin on June 7th. This will be a four-week journey that integrates the theme of my book, Intuition, Access Your Inner Wisdom, Trust Your Instincts, Find Your Path. Things we will explore include how to work with a lunar cycle to create a deeper relationship with your inner world, how to make a decision clearly and in tune with your inner wisdom, how to create enough space to really listen, how to trust your intuition and not follow your ego or wishful thinking. You can find out more about this and register your interest if you go to www.amisha.co.uk and click on events and you will see their intuitive flow beginning June the 7th till July the 5th. And don't forget, if you love this podcast, that you can become a member of Presence Collective or a patron. Full details on our community and support page and those offerings will be evolving into our community app which will launch in the autumn. We are also still putting together our in-person nature connection retreat gathering festival experience that will be co-curated and co-created by whoever comes. This is going to take place in the UK for around 100 people where we'll be camping together, eating together and sharing together over these days. And it's looking to take place from the 6th to the 12th of September. So put that date in your diary if you're interested and we will have more to share on that soon. My guest this week is Andres Roberts, who is a guide to human development through reconnection with nature. His work brings together innovative approaches to leadership and change wisdom from ancient cultures, and deep work with nature to support more whole and more generative forms of living and working for our times. He is the founding partner of the Bioleadership Project, co-founder of Way of Nature UK, and a guide to contemporary rites of passage to support deep transformation. Recently, Andres helped to launch the Global Bioleadership Fellowship, a community of people changing the story of human progress by working with nature. We explore the themes of nature quests, bio-leadership and belonging in this conversation called Optimal Blueprints of Connection. I hope that you enjoy this episode and it awakens more connection inside of you. As you listen to this, I am offline in nature with my phone and all technology turned off, taking some time to deeply listen, learn and be. I wish this for you too. Welcome to The Future is Beautiful, with me, your host, Amisha Gadiali. On this show, we explore the we between politics, spirituality, creativity, and sustainability. It's time for us to move beyond silos and into an integrated way of being. Every one of us has ideas and personal experiences to share that can lead us to a brighter future. This is the revolution. Despite the challenges we face as a global community or the pressures that we meet in our daily lives, when we stop and dare to dream, to ask ourselves the big questions and to share what we are already doing, we create the future that we wish to wake up for. That future is beautiful. I am delighted to welcome you to The Future is Beautiful. Thank you for being here with us today. Thanks, Amisha. It's really, really nice to join the the conversation. And I know it's a bigger conversation than just just this one. So yeah, it's great to be with you. Our first question, which we started to ask everybody recently, is 
what does a beautiful future mean to you? Wow. You make me think immediately of the um, it's WB Yeats, I think, who has a quote that says, the world is full of magic things, patiently waiting for our senses to come sharper. Oh, it's, we live in such a time of tussle, don't we? And, and strain and push and, and pull. But um, there are so many wonderful things. It is, it is such a beautiful world. It is such a beautiful world. We're doing, we're doing terrible things to it. And maybe, it, maybe a beautiful world is when we remember that all of those things are already there and remember to live with them and in relationship with them. And then all of a sudden we would care for the world and, and live in it in a better way. <laughs> yeah yeah what a place to start <laughs> but yeah that, that's that's what comes to mind when you say it and can you take us a little bit deeper into what that might look like or feel like or how we might go about that or maybe how we already are no it's good I mean it speaks both to that place in the future and the present in a way and it says a little bit about what I do or or I think more, the more time has passed over the years, the more I feel that a change and a better future comes from a, a shift in worldview in, in the lens through which we see the world. And, and a lot of what I've come to feel and think and work with is this notion that it's, there, there is, um, for a, a great part, we move through the world at the moment with a sense of disconnection, of you know, with this sort of innate separation of each other a sense of separation from nature and even within ourselves a sense of separation from all of the different parts of ourselves but if we rekindle a sense of connection if we rekindle a sense of even before we started we were already sort of speaking about wholeness weren't we you know if we rekindle a sense of wholeness of being part of something bigger then i feel that that creates a sense of implicitly sort of beauty and wonder within ourselves and a sense of being part of something greater and then naturally we would cultivate a more beautiful world the dominant notion of separation or of disconnection i think that's at the root of so many of the things that we might say are not beautiful in the world today um, whether it's the destruction of our natural environment or polarization and division in society you know, those things that we might say are the opposite of beautiful, we would heal them. They would become more whole if we kind of came back to that worldview level of, wow, we're part of something together and we are the same. Then the world manifests in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. Can you share a little bit around your journey, the work that I know you to do is is work that is about reconnecting us to nature and i'm curious as to whether that was a process that you had to go through in yourself or whether your childhood and your upbringing meant that you already felt very connected and it's been a process of bringing people into where you are or a little bit of both yeah it's a great question because it's you know it's funny i I do a lot of my work is reconnecting people with nature and what I call the well of that as a process is a contemporary form of nature quest or or vision quest where I help people go out alone and and listen to nature both inside of themselves and out in the world, and then really wonderful things reveal themselves and I can say a little bit more about that, but I wasn't necessarily brought up in a wild place. I was born in Colombia. I was there for the first seven years of my life. The memories that I have of, of that moment, you know, it was the late seventies and early eighties. It was noisy. There was a lot of concrete. There was a lot of loud music. Um, it was very rowdy. I have very strong memories of sort of beige and brown materials and um, rusty trucks and smoke chuffing up in the streets and so on and so on. But as I've been asked this question and I've reflected on it over the years, I, I think this question around uh, how do we listen to each other better? I've not shared this very much, but I, I do remember being a boy observing the grown-ups around the table speaking. And I remember thinking, wow, that, that person isn't listening to that other person. And that's always stayed with me really. And then when I, and then when I, graduated from university and I found myself working in a big company, that was the same question that I 
that I was holding actually, wow, I recognize that there are things happening in this big organization, this big community, and somehow that group of people aren't listening or speaking with the group of people over there. So that's always been present for me, that sense of how do we notice each other and listen to each other? But then I had a moment that was incredibly catalytic about, well, 12 years ago now, and a few things combined. One is I was carrying questions about how do we, how do we learn in more human ways? And I was carrying questions around, you know, wow, it, it feels like the structures that we've created in society do the opposite of supporting connection. You know, they separate us out, whether it's competition, whether it's businesses that want to grow in an independent way, whether it's organizational structures. Like I had questions around, hmm, something about this doesn't support people feeling whole. But much more than that, I did a master's that did two things. Well, it did many things for me, but I did this learning program which I thought was going to be a bit like a green MBA as in like, I thought I was going to learn about what is it to be a responsible business and what's an alternative form of economics. And it, and it was stuff like that, but it actually started off with what is it to be human and how have we come to, to see the world the way that we do in asking that it presented questions around, wow, how is it that we we've come to see nature as something outside of ourselves or as separate to ourselves? Alongside this, I remember being shown this image, which was a bubble with another circle inside of it. And that, that the big bubble said economy. And then the small circle inside of it said environment. We've come to see our planet and life itself as something that sits within economic thinking versus, you know, the world and life with the economy sitting inside of it. And it, it was, a, that was a big shift for me. That was a, not not just that in itself, but it it was a realization that oh, this is all about our internal sense making about what the world is. How do we how do we reconnect with that? But then I went and spent twenty four hours alone on the side of a mountain with the help of a friend, and I'd never been able to hear myself that way. And you know, by that point in my life, I'd been lucky. I'd traveled a bit. I'd seen the world. I'd got to eat nice food. I'd stayed in the nice hotels and still nothing compared to the kind of glory <laughs> of being on the edge of a cliff, just overlooking a wild, a wild valley. So I cultivated that sense. I cultivated that sense of, okay, yeah, we somehow have come to see the world from a place of disconnection. And actually there are things that we can do that bring a sense of, of reconnection and and it's a practice. I think the way that we live in the world today, you know, our education, the way we're brought up, our development doesn't lend itself to reconnecting necessarily. So we have to practice it. Yes. I feel like the point that is one worth delving a little bit deeper into is just the the kind of radicalness of what our culture has done in terms of how we view nature and how we view ourselves and how we view society, it requires just taking a step back completely because how can you understand yourself outside of the culture in which you've been raised in? And so when we are raised in this system of extraction and the system of all our value is based on our economic contribution and raised in the system where like we can take whatever we need from wherever, for whatever goals it is that we have, and especially if they're goals that make a lot of money, it's really wild when you just go, oh, wait, humans created this. Like, <laughs> this isn't how it has to be or how it's always been. This is something that we as humans at some stage have created. And, and we're all now trapped within that. And so even just having that moment where you go, wait, what does it actually mean to be a human? What actually is the relationship that is possible with our home, with our earth, with the thing that provides us with actually everything? Yeah, I agree with you. It's wild to think how far away we've come from that sense of closeness in the last 70, 80 years of, as a planet. Like I, I find myself doing things like um, we live in Bristol in what is a fairly urban place, but there are really lovely pockets of green and that feel wild. And so I, I was only I was doing this only yesterday. Actually, there's an old Victorian cemetery that that has become a bit of a haven over the pandemic, and I'll walk through it. 
but I actually let myself pretend that it's a forest. And then I'll imagine that there are even more trees and more species there. And and I found myself, you know, it was only a little tiny flicker of a thought or a feeling, but I, I let myself feel that it was as it would have been maybe 300 years ago or 400 years ago, like with all of it. And it's, it's so special. It's so special to think, wow, imagine stepping out of the door and being in a forest full of creatures and animals and plants and flowers. It's, there's something about being human. It deeply, deeply, we have evolved with the, with the natural world. And so we, cra- we don't have that on the doorstep anymore. We deeply crave it. The th- one of the things that makes us deeply happy is being in a place where we feel all of those things around us. And, and I, I mean, in the same breath, I think it's important not to romanticize it. I think it is important to say 70, 80 years ago, people were struggling to feed themselves. It wasn't about this fantasy world where, hey, you know, like Snow White and the old Disney cartoon, we sort of go out and dance with the birds and so on and so on. Yeah. But there's a lot of people that are struggling to feed themselves now as well. Exactly. Exactly. It's so, I suppose for me, it's over the last 50 years or more. And now, now we're at a crossroad where we have to decide, well, how do we progress a society? And I do think it's a choice to say the status quo has not, well, it's created the you know, the conditions for a less beautiful world. In fact, the very, we're trashing it, aren't we, the world? (laughs) So there is a way of developing again that brings the best of technology, that brings the best of engineering, that brings the best of human intellect, combined with our deep need and care and sense of belonging to something that's a sort of like a, a, a vibrant, natural world. And let us enjoy it. Let's sort of really revel in this idea that we're part of it as well. How heavy and tedious to sort of see ourselves as some kind of like smart brain outside of life. (laughs) You know, what a festival, what a joy to be part of this incredible biosphere that is, is paradise. That it can be no place as beautiful as where we are, you know, and if we replenish it, my God, what a joy. What a joy. Yeah. I I love that that we can yeah, fully recognize the the paradise of of being here and from a deeper spiritual perspective that we like honor that we are here and you know, life can feel long and arduous at times as we are balancing the the mundane and the daily kind of things that we have to do. And yet there's this sacred experience and it isn't a long time, you know, 90 years, if you're lucky, you know, most people, it won't be that. And also, you know, to be here and be healthy and to be able to create opportunity and connection and relationship and all of these things, it's, it's really such a gift. And I feel like what you're sharing, it invites us deeper into that as well, to really being able to, to be present with what's possible here. Yeah, what a beautiful phrase to be present with what is possible. Something about what you were saying then reminded me that I, I find that I find this a really helpful thing to keep in my mind actually. My dad is now 78 or 79. He's from the northwest of England. He was he's an engineer or he was an engineer all his, his working life and still thinks it, of course he's in his heart is an engineer's brain. And he worked for Unilever for a long time. And um, he would help them build factories. And he he said to me not long ago, he said, he calls me And. He said, And, do you know, we never thought where would all the plastic go? Like, so I imagine this guy in his 40s in, in 1970, so excited at the opportunity to travel around the world and see all of these exciting things in Africa and the Philippines. And he met my mum in Colombia. The human question, like the, to be presented with the challenge of like, how do we build an even better factory that makes soap for lots of people? I mean, of course, there's a capitalist model behind that, but still I think, you know, like how do we, like for him as the engineer, the, the boy who liked playing with Meccano in 1948 as a six-year-old, wow, how exciting to think we can build a factory that's going to feed more people or 
make soap for people. But but the question of where would the plastic go was never in their minds. So we've had a century or more of people being excited and feeling like they come alive with interesting questions, but we've lost the, but that sense of how does it connect to something bigger and how does it tend to what you're asking a more beautiful world hasn't been present. So to be present with possibility now is to say, we've got even more exciting questions. <laughs> how do we do all of that whilst living in a paradise and caring for our paradise? What I also hear in, in what you share is like, there's going to be a lot that we're missing <laughs> and that we won't know for 40 years. There are things that we're, we're not even considering at this moment. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, that, maybe that's part of that worldview that we haven't got at the moment, isn't it? Or it's probably come up in some of your podcasts before, this idea of the children's fire, of how, how do we live today thinking about seven generations ahead and what decisions do we yeah. make now? Yeah, we've had Mac McCartney come and share about that. From the perspective of the work that you do, how do we do that? How do we honour seven generations to come? How do we listen to them? I had a moment about three, four years ago where with the nature quests that we guide, it honours that traditional rite of passage even of kind of leaving society, going out into the wild, observing nature, coming back, sharing stories, listening to other people's stories, listening to what feels important when we strip everything back and we just sort of spend some time with nature and with life. Over time, one of the things that I found more, more comfortable to say, it feels like a clearer truth, is that those experiences quite often are about belonging. Like what we want is a sense of belonging. That's one of our deepest needs, I think. And alongside that, I'm enough. I belong and I'm enough. What incredible beliefs to carry as a person through life. And when we have that, then so many other things I think feel kind of reprioritized or, 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 or rebalanced. So when we sense I, I'm enough, I belong, then I don't, I don't need more material stuff necessarily. It becomes easier to sort of do things that might be to the detriment of our immediate planet now or others now, but also of people sort of seven generations ahead. That that's comes to mind. And I think also it's really lovely to hear you earlier say, you know, that sense of like, wow, you know, what are we not thinking about now that might, might happen in 40 years? I think there's something about being in relationship with that sense of constant change, like everything is constantly changing. Everything is constantly changing and moving and still it's part of a continuous pattern of life. And when we connect with that, then I think we lose that sense of trying to fix things and control things, which is part of, I think, the paradigm that we live in at the moment. Like we become much more adept at living with uncertainty, living with fluidity, knowing that you know life is constantly evolving and changing but still having a sense of groundedness within that and so I, I again it comes back to that worldview thing that i was talking about before when we come back to a sense of a worldview of like i belong i'm part of nature i'm part i'm part of life i know that things are constantly changing and but i can tend to a healthy rhythm of how life flows then i think naturally our ideas about okay how do i care for people seven gen generations ahead to change. So maybe it's about nourishing those values and that worldview rather than a fixed idea of, uh, oh, I have to do something now that's going to help somebody, you know, in 70 or 80 or 100 or more years time. Let's nourish how we're being now rather than think almost transactionally about what am I doing for somebody else in the future. Absolutely. I feel like we are all carrying the seeds of the future within us. We are the future, you know, we're here. Like we are creating the future that is built into just being here now. And some of it doesn't have to be thought through with like that kind of rigorous kind of intellect and solutions and, you know, as you said, kind of fixing. But actually when we are able to embrace more of the beingness of who we are and 
to listen to the more than human realms in in whatever form that they are, whether it's the trees, whether it is our our future grandchildren, you know, that maybe if we listen deep enough, we can hear something. And to also be able to live in a way where the the information that's that's sort of alive in us is able to find its way into this world. I love that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is such a wonderful question to hold, isn't it? What is the seed that we already are now of that future? And you made me think about, we were talking a bit, a bit about her before we started the, the call. My, my, my daughter, who's two and a half years old now, of course you're presented with all of these sorts of questions about what, what is she going to see in her life? And if she has children, what are they going to see in their life? And I, I've come to a place, I came to a place a long time ago of thinking, they, they're going to see a lot of suffering. The, the generations that follow us from now, you know, we're going to see some really tough things. And perhaps, you know, a pandemic is just a, a little signal of some of the big systemic earth system changes that are going to affect people in very intense ways. And And still, I feel like one of the best things that I can do for my daughter is give her a sense that she's already good enough. You know, that she's, it's that word again, that she belongs. It's very subtle. I, I don't think I can do that in words. Or maybe you can, you know, maybe encouragement and so on and so on. It's very, very subtle. I think it's almost the way of being. It's almost the way of being and a, a way of accepting and a way of challenging and so on. If collectively we we give that sense of groundedness, if we help each other find that sense of groundedness, then hopefully we can help create a culture that, moves away from that extractive taking consuming feeding h- hungry ghosts as that they would as they would say in the buddhist traditions no and stands solidly and is more able to tend to life with care you know their own lives and the lives of others and maybe that's the thing that ripples out in future generations so for me you know it's like let's just hold back from trashing it anymore right now <laughs> And yes, let's replenish as much as we can, but but also that sense of of belonging feels really, really key for me. That's really beautiful. And as you're speaking, it's like I feel, you know, thinking about your daughter, like feeling her, I, it's it's an energetic experience to to know that you belong, to know that you're enough, to know that, yeah, that you're here. Like it is amazing that you're here. It's the maths around like how a human being actually makes it into this world is it boggles me every time I try and like look at this equation that someone's made of like the possibility that just to be born and and then to be born healthy. And I feel like so many of us have grown up without that real sense of, of belonging and enoughness and that that then becomes a whole journey. But if you can really give that to a child and then just let them be who they are and let them bring the seeds that they're carrying fully into this world, then for sure we have a more beautiful future. Yeah, I, I, I think that. I think that. We've seen it in other cultures, actually. And, and I think we have enough of a story now to know how a, a dominant Quote, let's call it the Western paradigm, was pretty brutal and challenging. <laughs> Some of the worldviews that carried that sense of belonging and presence to what is. I love that. I'm coming back to that expression that you used. I love it so much, present to what is possible, but all present to being in paradise. You know how a lot of my own sort of learning and my, my stories, I owe a lot to a gentleman called John P. Milton, who's in the US. He once shared with me a Taoist principle and held it as kind of a contrast to, again, a lot of contemporary Western development. And in the way of nature, we work with it as a, as a sort of a layering of what relaxation. I mean, a quick way of saying it is that relaxation is, is one of the kind of gateways to accessing deep wisdom, deep source, deep sense of belonging, deep joy, and so on and so on. But the deepest layer of it is to trust life, is to trust life. That's how John describes it. But the reason I'm saying it in this context is because he then says, you know, the, the, the Taoists, to get to that place, or, or a fundamental belief of the, of the Taoists was that we are born fundamentally perfect. 
I, you know, we're part of life. We've gone through that miracle of being alive. It is a paradise. And without thinking it somewhere deep in our body, you know, it's, it's possible to have that belief that, wow, we're part of this incredible show. So let's, let's enjoy it. Let's enjoy the gift of life. Yeah. But it's not easy to get to that place, obviously. <laughs> Hello. We're taking a short pause from the conversation. On behalf of our team and our community, thank you for being here and co-creating The Future is Beautiful. Much dedication, love and time goes into the production of this show. We believe in being advertising free in a world that's always trying to sell us stuff we don't need. And so we make this show with you and for you, thanks to your support. There are three ways you can be more involved. So we can share the vision, wisdom, and creativity here as we explore what it means to be a human in this time. You can support the podcast by sharing it with your friends, posting episodes on social media, and doing iTunes reviews. You can support as a patron by making a monthly or one-off donation of your choice. And with this, you join the global patrons group and monthly video calls where we share connection and insight. You get to know the other amazing patrons from around the world, their stories and their work, and you offer direct support to me and the team, as well as being brought into the behind the scenes of creating something like this. It sounds like a lot, but it's as much or as little as you want to get involved in. You can become a member of Presence, our membership collective of care and practice, where we explore how to embody the themes of the podcast with workshops, calls, special events, tree whispers, and powerful tools, practices, and rituals that you can bring into your life. This is open to absolutely everybody as we create an inclusive and diverse space that celebrates well-being as a human right, where we explore together what it means to be creative, courageous, and connected to ourselves, each other, and the earth. This is about embodying sacred activism. We love meeting patrons and presence members and how being part in this way weaves our lives together as well as making this show possible. If anything from this conversation has moved or inspired you, please get more involved. All information can be found at www.thefutureisbeautiful.co forward slash community. This show really can't go on without your patronage and presence membership, so please do make it happen. And now, back to the conversation. In the retreats and experiences that you do, what do you see happen when you take people out on these experiences of connection? Do you know, it's so wonderful. Two weeks ago, two weekends ago, we took a group out for what was 36 hours. It was the first group I've taken out for more than six months. Uh, It was only six people because we're still trying to keep things really contained. And it felt like we were out in the best possible way for about four days. Um, It was so light. I love it because it's such an honest process. When I help to guide people in that way, once they're alone, they're just alone with who they are their own truths, their own lights, their own shadows, the stars, the winds, the cold, the rain, the the sun. It's so it's so honest. There's no production. There's no glossy wrapping or advertising about it. So it's really it's really great <laughs> to be able to speak about it. Even again, over the years of different things, there's something about recognizing how busy we are with things that are so ephemeral and daft in a way i mean there are things that make life up but there's something about letting those things drop back into this into the background i found myself saying to someone the other day what happens when we take the time to listen to nature and to be with nature in a particular way is that a different form of knowledge reveals itself sometimes it's hard to say it in words so all of a sudden with with time with practice we start to integrate the sense that as i said earlier Everything is constantly changing. Everything is constantly changing. That's the norm. Therefore, we can let go of a little bit of control. Therefore, I can I can loosen, I think, a little bit of those contractions and those tight grips that I that I have on things that I want to control. The thing we've spoken about so much about that sense of belonging. I always remember what years ago somebody saying, and it's come up a few times over the years, wow, I, I really got that sense of rotating around the globe. You know, like when we're sort of outside alone and you can see the moon pass and the stars pass overhead. Wow, I really got that sense of being, you know, sort of rotating around the globe. And from, and from thoughts like that, very quickly come senses of like, 
and I got that sense of being part of something bigger. So very often people will come back with that sense of, um, I remembered how small I am, but in the best possible way, I also remembered that I'm part of something bigger. So notions of change, notions of being part of something bigger, notions of seeing problems and questions and dreams in life from a slightly different perspective. Like I, it's really incredible what we hold in the subconscious and how the sub, I think the subconscious is constantly trying to help us. Like parts of the subconscious is constantly trying to help us do good things. Talk about beautiful, you know, like the subconscious wants us to do beautiful things. We really want to create and make and do and mend and, <laughs> and glow. So things reveal themselves about us. And sometimes things kind of untangle themselves a little bit as well. And sometimes maybe nothing happens, but it's just good to sort of be there. I love what you share about the subconscious. You know, I feel like we talk about this a lot around, say, the physical body, that, you know, our physical body is an incredible healing tool. It self heals. Like it's amazing. Cut yourself and then you will no longer have a cut at some point. Your body will just do that. And all you have to do is support yourself in the right circumstances. And of course, there are ways that you can support your healing process. And sometimes, of course, we need surgery and medical interventions, but so much happens just because the body, it's geared that way in order to to bring you back into an optimal blueprint. And I feel like with the subconscious, I suppose because I do so much healing work and like trauma work, often we're in that space of like, The subconscious patterns, the ones that are holding us back, the ones that are pulling us into traumas, you know, and, and it's true, all of that exists. And it's an incredible time that we're living in where there's so much understanding around that and how we can work with it. And then at the same time, it's just having that awareness that your subconscious is helping you, that, you know, your dreams are helping you to resolve things at night naturally, that when you spend time even just going for a walk and looking around and noticing the smells and how, how your feet feel on the ground and how the air feels today, that that all invites that very like natural healing process that happens with our inner worlds as well. And I I suppose that's the simplicity of so much what we call spiritual practice, which is really just giving ourselves space whether it's in meditation, whether it's in yoga nidra, whether it's spending time in a forest, but it, it's giving ourselves space for that, that very natural creativity that exists within us to happen. And that very natural desire and connection to beauty. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you use the word pattern and that, that's exactly it. It's what are the patterns that we're living with and how do we the, the body and the mind, I suppose, once there is a natural pattern, we do have a natural pattern, I think, that feels good. <laughs> I, I find it interesting that because we live in the world in the way we do today, it's very quick to then say, oh, I need to go out and take time in nature to bring this back into my life. Or I need to do something to rebalance. It's, it's almost as if the frame is, I'm still going to try and get something back from nature. It's like nature is a medicine. But of course, the the other frame of it is that the way we live modern life takes us so far away from what is more natural for us. The intensity, the busyness, the lack of space and so on and so on. And then, of course, you know, I think so often living in cities and being out and being being away from a natural environment, it's it's that it's 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 that lifestyle is exclusive or, or or takes away something that's oxygen to us, almost literally. Of course we need time to go out, back out into retreats and nature and so on and so on. But then we mustn't kid ourselves that that, that, that is the natural norm. <laughs> I think the natural norm should be, yeah, we spend loads more time outside with our senses and breathing and connecting or being connected. Yeah, I was talking to... Karen Downs this week, who is the founder of FemQ, and we were talking about feminine intelligence. And in our call, you know, she just said, like, nature is in us. You know, it's like this idea that we 
we are nature. We have to go into nature. It's like nature is always coming into us, but we don't always have space to understand that or to feel it. And, you know, I, I was sharing with you before we started recording that in other times of, of my life, you know, that is, has been very, it's just been a very natural part of, of my being and maybe being on maybe some of the kind of benefits of sort of the lifestyle that I was living and without a lot of responsibilities, without children, you know, with able to kind of explore deeper into connection in so many ways. This year, I've had a lot of responsibility and a lot of time at the computer. I've been having to support family members in ways that isn't optimal for what I understand already to be my optimal blueprint. Like I, I, I have journeyed enough to know what I need in order to really thrive and feel connected. And sometimes we have cycles of life where that's not possible. I'm sure you can relate to that with a, with a young child, that there are times where you're like, well, I know what I need, but this is nature as well, that I'm, you know, to be caring for our young, to be caring for our elders. And that sometimes when we're in that time of life where we're the ones, you know, that are holding that responsibility, we have to give more to our young and to our elders. And it could be depleting. And I, I found myself really yeah, just being like, okay, I really need <laughs> to go and turn everything off and turn off the phones and everything and just be and just be in nature and listen to the birds and watch the stars and be able to notice the subtlety with which they look different the next night than they did before or the next hour and and actually be able to be in that presence. And I was having a moment last night of like, maybe there's not time for this. And I woke up this morning, there has to be. <laughs> and, and as we're speaking, I, you know, I can feel my soul, like just being like, ah, like kind of remembering what that feeling is when we let go of all of these mundane things or these beautiful responsibilities of, of our life and, and the complexities of our life, which also offer a lot of beauty as well as complexity. And when our friends are listening to this conversation, I will be in that space where everything will be, everything digital will be turned off. And I will be there recharging and re-remembering. And I feel like that subtlety of like, not going into that as an extractive experience where like I'm going to be given something to be then able to keep going with my crazy capitalist complex life. But actually subtly changing that framework of I'm going to re-remember my part in nature, to, to re-remember the nature that I am and that my presence in nature is a gift. It's in a, a relationship of sacred reciprocity that I'm not going to nature saying, okay, fix me, <laughs> like, you know, but I'm going to say, I'm here. Let's, let's dance together. Let's play together. Let's nourish each other. Yeah, that's wonderful. For me, as you speak, you describe the bridge of our times <laughs> in a way. You know, that sense of we've come so far away from it and we, we need it for ourselves individually. And at the same time, how do we do that in a way that sort of slowly starts to just reconnect these worlds? So like the, the notion of bridging so often comes up in my work and my life, and you know, alongside the way of nature processes and the quests. One of the things that's kept me busy the last years is, is what we call the bio leadership project, which explicitly says that story of human progress, that dominant human story of leadership and human progress is, is a root to so many of the problems. So what would a new story of human progress look like if we really genuinely reconnected with nature and worked with nature as partner? But it's keeping me so busy. <laughs> and this last year has been crazy. So how do I do that bridging work? You know, how do we do that bridging work while still taking time for ourselves? <laughs> And not getting lost in the busyness of it. And it's, I love what you just said about, I think the intention goes such a long way, that intention of reciprocity. 
it counts. I was listening to um, Braiding Sweetgrass the other day and this idea of honourable harvest. We still have to make, we still have to consume, we still have to eat, but how do we do it with honour? Like, how do we do it, you know, in a sacred way? And, and you know, maybe maybe we're moving culturally to a place where a word like sacred isn't scary. Maybe it means more like, you know, we do it with respect and with love, with dignity, with a sense of reciprocity, as you said. How could we not when we live in such a special place? How could we not? And the, the other thing that came to mind as you were speaking was with things like the Nature Quest. It's interesting, actually. Again, John Milton would say... The quest in itself is not the practice. The practice is back in life. The quest is more, I call it the well. You know, it's more like the well where we'll go and we'll sip some water. And then from that, we carry qualities and feelings and knowledge that's helpful for our daily lives. But I think because our daily lives at the moment are so, you know, this. As, when I say at this moment, I mean this era really of humanity, it's pretty intense. It's pretty intense. So we do need some extra kind of support and we need to help each other out a little bit back in those everyday life moments. I suppose it speaks to what is the culture that we're trying to, to nourish in the world? How do we make these patterns part of our life, but also patterns of, of how society works, whether it's in education or a business or governments and so on? And through the work that you're doing with bioleadership, what can you share in, in answer to those questions? Well, I mean, I think a good thing with the bioleadership project is to start with, it's good to recognize that there are now thousands of stories around the world of people actually saying, yeah, of course, we need to do something differently. And working with nature is a given. And what we're doing with the bioleadership project is effectively trying to hold a, a network, like a, a mycelium, an under the surface network of connections that helps positive stories and nutrients and knowledge to connect so that a new culture emerges. One of the things that I say with bioleadership is, uh, we've said it already in the call, if we take the time to listen to nature in a deeper way, then a new form of knowledge emerges. So with the Bioleadership Project, we think that there are five kinds of story growing in the world that emerge from a deeper connection, a deeper sense that, yeah, we're part of this, so we can build and we can work with it. A first kind of story is that we can change our definition of purpose and progress. So rather than an insane idea that growth happens relentlessly and continuously, we shift away from GDP or profit and move towards perhaps more circular forms of measurement, or let's take Bhutan with gross national happiness. You know, you change what you measure, and if you change what you measure, you change what you grow towards. So that's that's happening. A second kind of story is about different organizational forms inspired by nature. So in a world where for the last 200 years, the hierarchical, centralized command and control and often, of course, command and control driven by white European men, etc. That model is changing. And if we tune into how nature's work more in groups of cells or dynamic living systems, then we start to change our organizing forms that work more from the ground up. And inevitably from the ground up means more that we care for what's on the ground. <laughs> Another kind of story is about working more like ecosystems, like let's dissolve this idea that we are competitive components in a machine. And how do we start to work more as movements that interconnect knowledge and, and potential and work better as wholes? I think that's, that's a different movement. And then the last two, just to, to try to be concise is I think there's a fourth story, which is about regenerative models, you know, again, challenging the notion of linear extraction and waste and working more as replenishing cycles. Like the re regenerative movement, even in the last 12 months, I think has just mushroomed in so many places. It's incredible. And then lastly, I think the fifth story is, well, actually a shift in culture. You know, we're starting to see organizations, communities, perhaps, you know, again, what you're doing in the podcast is places where that deeper belief 
that we are part of nature, that we are nature, is the base model, as it were. It's the cultural norm. Then, you know, many other things start to happen. But but um, I, st- I think we're starting to see that. I think we're starting to see places where it could be a business or a school or a community. We are nature is the given. And that's an exciting shift as well. Beautiful. Yeah. What are some of the things that you've been most inspired by, like in terms of stories? Oh, such a good question. It's just always really nice to hear the specific examples. They bring it to life. Of course, I can understand. Yeah. I'm really inspired by a company. They're called Guadiaki and they are in Latin America. And they're headquartered in California, but they're in Latin America. And they produce yerba mate tea. And yerba mate, you know, is the really popular tea in, in Argentina. Everything that they do in the production of their teas ultimately replenishes rainforest and protects indigenous groups. So there's a lot about their processes and their supply chains and how they work in relationship with people and the land. It's hard, it's hard to describe it without going into too much detail exactly how they do it. But if I share this with you, there's a woman called Flor Casiraghi, who is the head of their foundation and leads a lot of their educational projects. And she says, we just know, we just know that when people come and spend time in the nature reserves that we work with, they leave and there is a different impact in the world. So Guadiaki for me, and in, you know, and speaking to them in the past, you know, they've also said how music and art has been a really important part of what they've done. So they've got this really brilliant way of understanding supply chains and operations in a way that's replenishing and life-giving. But the spirit beneath it comes from this place of knowing that we're part of a bigger story and that art and that wonder is essential to it. And for me, that's that's a really ex- exciting kind of bioleadership story. But I also think, you know, some of this is about like over and over, I feel like nobody can do it alone. No, you know, nobody can do it alone. And the, some of the most exciting stories are of people just saying, you know, I don't have the answers and we need to ask a, a better set of questions. And I know Patagonia are often used as an example, but again, you know, very recently what they did with anti-racism, I think is great because they said, God, we realize we've not really looked at this for ever. And so we're going to change how we operate to make sure that we're doing the right thing for people and the planet. And are they? I don't know what they're doing around anti-racism. I mean, I know I know kind of what they're doing in terms of like degrowth, like, you know, saying, okay, we're not just going to grow, 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 like that there has to be a different equation. But I haven't heard about that anti-racism work. I mean, I wouldn't want to say because I don't know enough about it, but I know that in sort of November, I think last year, they put out a big public announcement saying, we're holding our hands up to this and we're going to start doing a lot more. I do work with Patagonia. I haven't done through the pandemic, but I know that they're really busy at the moment trying to work properly with this. And so that honesty, you know, at least to say, well, we're trying to do something is really good. I could connect you with them actually, because it might be nice to sort of do something on that. Yeah, for sure. And I think if anyone is going to do something meaningful like it, it as a as a company you know that they are they have their approach to sustainability and regeneration has been more genuine and more and and deeper than many other companies so hopefully they actually could lead how a global company does approach anti-racism yeah we have a project which we're calling the beacons project and it's finding people who are holding those questions and, and i i find the beacons, the organizations who are, and people, individuals, and sometimes it's small projects, you know, the the places where we can learn the most, I think, are, the, are where you see a vulnerability and an honesty. Something I appreciate about Patagonia is that they, they will openly say, we are not a sustainable business, but we're trying to be a responsible business. And it's so much more um, energizing. But you've got to be honest about it, then you? And you've got to be committed to trying to do something about it. That's what makes a difference. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, 
the origins in this podcast were like saying, hang on, I'm kind of tired of people telling me that they they know. <laughs> like, you know, how how do they know? <laughs> and and so actually wanting to create a space where we can explore like the complexity and the, the genuine challenge of being human at this time, where in our hearts of hearts, we might want something to be a certain way, but we also are implicit in it not being that way. And, and, and how do we hold space for that, which we don't know as well as that, which we, which we can see. Someone said it very recently to me, you know, when, when will we get to the moment where in big, I mean, imagine in big policy work and po- politics and in, in big corporates, you know, the, the smartest thing to say in the moment is we don't have the answer here. So how, shall we look at it together in a different way? It's interesting because I also feel called to sort of say, when you say, where do we see the big examples? Like how, how could we honor or put a light on the hundreds of thousands, probably of micro stories of farmers doing things differently. We've put a call out for this fellowship, this bioleadership fellowship. We originally said up to 108 people around the world. And I'll be so happy if, you know, just from the first year we have 50, 60 stories of people trying to change human progress with nature. Just yesterday, I was a gentleman in Sierra Leone, a farmer, got in touch. I was like, wow, <laughs> you know, but, but this is about, I would love to learn what he's doing. And has he shared with you what he's doing? I've looked at his sites and he's, it's a project which is about building community, working with women's rights through food through food and the, the principles of these stories like we're we're in a moment where hopefully let's take an organization like a unilever who is doing you know which is doing good stuff all of a sudden there are more people there willing to listen to what the farmer in sierra leone is is doing you know like i think it's that that conversation of changing the flow of information and questions so that it's less top yeah. down. I mean, I I never said big examples. I just asked for examples. No, you- and so for, from my perspective, you know, we've named Patagonia and Unilever, but I'd love to hear the name of this farmer in Sierra Leone and the website so we can all go and see what he's doing and and bring those stories into our consciousness and into our understanding. So can you share like who this is and yeah. What their website As is. I say, he only reached out yesterday and I had a quick look yeah. at his site. But if you if you were to Google, sometimes he shows up as Musa Joe, M-U-S-A, Joe. And sometimes Joe Musa. He's in Sierra Leone. We're working with um, a project in Peru. They're a fellow in the fellowship called Alto Peru. And they work with vulnerable children and take them surfing. When we met them, they said, you know, in our work, the mountain is in our team and the sea is in our team. Um, and they're doing really amazing things, helping to make children's lives better by by reconnecting with the ocean and working with the ocean. That's come up recently. So Alto Peru is a good one. And another fellow is um, a woman who, she's called Sadika, and she's in Cape Town, and she works with young people many of whom have experienced sexual abuse as well. And they they work with um, taking children and, and young people up to Tabletop Mountain as part of the healing process. So, you know, this deep work is happening. And as, and as we were saying, you know, the, for me, the joy of the fellowship is some of the people in the bigger organizations will share their stories alongside Sadika and Diego, who's in Peru. All sharing that honesty of like what happens when we when we reconnect and heal and work with nature what is your call to action to close our conversation here and you are allowed to you're allowed an inner and an outer one so the outer one would be something that people can actually go and support and get involved in and then the inner one something that we can actually take from this conversation into our lives Thank you. My first one is um, the thing we've spoken about here. What if we had a culture where we regularly took the time to listen to nature in a different way, made that part of our practice? So the call to action for all of us is to really enjoy that paradise. (laughs) And whether it's once a month or once every 
few months or once a day to to really wouldn't it be wonderful to help each other make room in life to really listen with nature and that feels nice to say and then check out if you get a chance the bioleadershipfellowship.org we're calling out for projects and people who've got a passion to change human progress with nature yeah that's really live at the moment we're trying to find more people to sort of come and join that process and, and be part of a really brilliant journey so those would be the two things to say and you you can find out more about the bioleadership project and the and the nature quest through that site as well so so i'll leave it at that so that call to action is to join your fellowship is that what you're saying like it's not like to share stories it's like to actually kind of become a part of the fellowship like join the course to join or to maybe connect us with people who are who would make good fellows as well and what exactly is a fellow can you be clear on like what a fellow is so for example is moose earth could be a fellow from sierra leone because they're doing this work yeah so the call is for people who are working on a project or who are holding a question about how they might change something what could be a project it could be something in a business it could be something in a community but to make a positive breakthrough looking for support from peers and, and by working with nature so if you are someone or who you or if you know someone who is on the edge of a really interesting breakthrough for themselves or for their community or for their organization and they could do with a little bit of help or they could do it even more magically by working with nature that's the kind of person that we'd love to connect with for the fellowship okay great and how would you like people to connect deeper with you well i'm on linkedin i'm finding that really helpful if anybody wants to connect and say hello or i'm at andres at bio leadership.org brilliant thank you for sharing with us today uh, thanks for inviting me along amisha thank you thank you for spending your precious time with us as always you can find links to everything we mention in this episode download our book and discover so much more over on the blog we don't believe in selling you things you don't need through this podcast and so it's made possible with you our community if you loved this and would like to fund our show with a monthly donation or join our online group to connect with other listeners please visit www.thefutureisbeautiful.co and click on community and support. Please also share with friends, hit subscribe and leave us a review so we can grow. Those gold stars really help others find us so these ideas can spread. Here is to us, creating a beautiful future together. The Future is Beautiful is made by an all-female team working voluntarily or on reduced rates until our listener support grows. If you have been moved by anything you heard here, please donate the equivalent of buying us a drink. All donations make a huge difference to us and will allow us to keep doing this and remain advertising free. Until next time, I leave you with this question. How will you create beauty in the world?